Hello, hello, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I am Brett Garcia. I am here to moderate this talk. Um, there is an excellent woman who will be signing. I'm looking forward to how she deals with the swears that will invariably happen. Um, I'm about to introduce a very special guest. Uh, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes, but if any of you have any questions for Bill Lawrence or myself, you can put them in, I believe there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom and you can write in there. And for the last sort of 15, 20 minutes, we'll deal with those questions. So now, if you could all, if you're at home, I assume you are, I hope you are, please clap, put your hands together and welcome the creator, co-creator of, creator of many of the greatest sitcoms you've ever seen, Scrubs, Cougar Town, Spin City, and the co-creator and showrunner of Apple TV's smash hit show, Ted Lasso. Please welcome to the show, it's Mr. Bill Lawrence. Hey, by the way, you're, I, I, I know that Brett's trying to embarrass me when he does this. Brett and I just got the right Lasso. For those of you that don't know Brett and just are recognizing him, I think as a, uh, hey Kel, you help me one second, this thing keeps dipping down. That's just what you say to a random person. The, uh, 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 you're gonna recognize him as an actor from the show, Ted Lasso, but uh, he's uh, uh, also a writer producer of the show. He's created his own shows. And so I'm gonna ask him as many questions as he asked me, that's the plan. Okay, okay. Well, look, so this is a proper writing thing, right? This is for real writers to learn shit and stuff. So, well, I guess if, let's start with, let's start, let's deal with Ted Lasso. How did Ted Lasso, come about for you, Bill Lawrence? Uh, you know what, I was chasing um, Jason Sudeikis down as a leading man for a streaming show, because uh, I think he's the type of guy that can be a uh, uh, comedic male lead, a romantic male lead. This is gonna be fun because the, my iPad keeps going a little down, so I'll just keep kind of rising up in the frame. The, uh, um, uh, and he was not remotely interested, well now I'm not even on that. Uh, th he's not remotely interested in the show I wanted to do. And uh, um, he said, what about these videos I made a few years ago of Ted Lasso? And we watched them. A lot of comedy writers watch them. They're really funny, but they're very sketchy. He's an SNL guy um, and loud and brash and kind of, I didn't see it as a TV show. And to Jason's credit, um, uh, he said he's recognized more as Ted Lasso overseas and for any SNL character or movie he had done. And that he said he thought it might be a fun challenge, you know, to uh, kind of humanize that character and do a show like Scrubs in which there's big kind of emotional depth and pathos behind the comedy. And then how he really sold me was to say, it would just be so fun, you know, to do our uh, version of a sports movie, you know, but instead of only having an hour and a half, you have, you know, a whole season to kind of play with those tropes and, uh, uh, give some humanity to the characters and have things like a, a female villainess that's trying to destroy the team like in Major League, but then you take the time to explore her character and uh, um, uh, manipulate people into being empathetic for her and seeing how she got to where she got. And uh, that's what sold me. That was how we kind of got into doing the show. We went and pitched it around town and uh, we did not pitch Brett Goldstein as Roy, not right away. You know, we just knew you were going to be a writer. Um, the amazing thing, for those of you that have been through this process, it's always good to have IP, which is these funny, funny videos or you know intellectual property, but to try and convince different streaming sites that it, the show is going to be different than the videos they watched was near impossible. And actually, only Apple uh, took a shot at it, so we're very lucky. That was a condensed version, Brett. It's the best I could that was, do. That was good. I'm impressed. Now, what uh, I think if I may, I learned a lot doing this show. I came on as a writer uh, because you called me up in the middle of nowhere and told me to come to LA and do it. And I was delighted. Uh, but I have written in England where usually most shows are made with two people. There's two writers. You make six episodes for, for $50 and that's, <laughs> that's British TV. Do you only and, get 50 um, bucks? That's it? You get 50 bucks for the, for the whole season. And... Um, you bring your own sandwiches and you know, uh, you, you make your own sets. Basically, it's a, it's a hobby in Britain, but you know, one we enjoy. So coming to America- oh, and The UK is a hobby, I like that. Yeah, yeah, 
but, it means but we know you it love it. Job. To do it is a job felt very exciting. But genuinely, I'm sure people are curious, and I'm, I thought it was fascinating how you run this thing. Firstly, what is it, having done as many shows you have, how do you pick a writer's room? Because it's, to me, from observing it, it's like, it's like casting a show. Seems like you pick a different, different personality types, different, like what, what for you is the key to staffing a show? Uh, this one was really interesting how we decided to put it together because uh, um, there were a lot of factors and, uh, you know, Jason is without a doubt my partner in doing this. And then Brendan Hunt, who plays Coach Beard, and Joe Kelly um, were also uh, kind of creators of the show, you know, back in the day with Jason and worked on the show now as, as, as writers. Um, we knew two things that we had to handle right off the bat. One was um, to do a show that seems authentic uh, and takes place in the UK. American writers always below that. You know, so we knew we had to have some talented Brits uh, on staff. And so we hired um, this uh, young um, whip smart writer named Brett Goldstein, a young lady named uh, Phoebe Walsh. Um, and the other thing that is, is really interesting is anytime you're venturing into the weird world of sports, um, it's so easy to blow it. And if it doesn't seem authentic, those of us that are actual sports fans can spot that a mile away. And the uh, football fans, i.e. soccer fans in the UK, it's so um, uh, regional. And the only thing akin to that in the US is college football. Um, and it was very important to us as we found you and Phoebe, Brett, that you both um, have family history entrenched in a specific club. So you knew what that cult-like devotion, I mean, what was your family's team again? It was- well, I grew up uh, with Tottenham, Tottenham. But like my dad is a football hooligan and if uh, like it's full on, I'm sure it's the same with American sports, I don't know, but with my dad it was like our births were planned around games. Like as in if, if we had been born on the day of a game, my dad would not have been there. And that was sort of understood. <laughs> and that was like, not just like, that would be like, yeah, no, totally understood. <laughs> no one would judge him for that. And, um, and, and Phoebe's, Phoebe's, uh, Phoebe's, Phoebe's Crystal Palace. Palace. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was the first thing is knowing we had to hire people to help us bridge the cultural gap. Even, by the way, the only running gag in the writer's room that's lasted both years so far is how many jokes or moments get ruined by the fact that Brett or Phoebe has to say, we would never say that in, uh, in and, and, and usually Phoebe says some ridiculous word version of what they would say and it always kills the joke kills the moment it's buzz kill um and then the second thing we knew is I, i've already mentioned to you um uh, uh four male names i mean me uh and the, the three the other three creators who created the character originally joe kelly brennan the hot jason sudeikis and uh what we knew and with brett here you're looking at the whole male writing staff and what we knew was that for a show like this to succeed and not be a kind of niche show of, of just inside the locker room uh, and uh, uh, that we really needed to protect, promote and uh, um, the female leads of the show, um, Juno Temple, Anna Waddingham who play Rebecca and Keeley. And so we really went about hiring um, uh, not only a great female writing staff, but really strong and, and disparately com comedically different female voices. Uh, and I, I don't want to say it always breaks along gender lines, but I do want to say that the, uh, the positive response to the female leads of this show and how they have their own journeys and how they have a, a real friendship and don't seem to be only ciphers that surface the other character. I think it's in, in, in great part to a uh, super strong voiced female writing staff um, uh, that protects, promotes, and, and, and writes for them. And you gotta, you gotta also, it's a weird tidbit about Ted Lasso, is Jason knew this was a priority from the start, and this was without a doubt sold as the Jason Sudeikis show. And he, it was very important when he fought for it that still the show starts, even on a new streaming site, not with Jason Sudeikis, but with a very long scene um, um, uh, featuring only Hannah Waddingham, you know, the female lead. And so he wanted to make that statement early on. But uh, 
that was one of the tough things about putting together staff. The other thing was, look, when, let me ask you a question. When you run a show, because it's only you and the 50 bucks, you know yeah. you're going to put everything through your typewriter and you're going to ultimately take a pass at everything, correct? Yeah, correct. All right. So that, you know, that was the show running world I grew up with. But I think on this show, especially when you start with Jason Sudeikis having created the character and he's at, you know, at the very least, the co-head writer, you know, he was a writer first on SNL um, before he was a performer of this show. I had to uh, uh, let go a little bit my control freak ways and realize um, that saying there's a lot of chefs on this particular show is not a negative. And um, you had to acknowledge and bring in a lot of outside voices from a passionate soccer fan to uh, a young British woman who knows a lot more about what being a wag is than I did to Jason, who is like an answer key. Cause you think you might have a good line for Ted Lasso, but he's right there in the room and he can say it and decide in real time if it's a good line or not. And so the, the most interesting thing was finding a staff that got along that everybody was comfortable speaking and hearing their voice because there were so many chefs on this show um, and not just one person kind of steering the ship. How would you, I, I mean, I, I thought you, you know, look, I learned an awful lot from you, but you could tell the people here how, because it seems to me you had a pretty clear way of, particularly in the beginning, how you run a room. Like from my observation, it was sort of two weeks of kind of just getting to know each other. So we were all comfortable with each other, just talking around that table. And then after that, we started talking character. It was quite a while before we were talking big story. And I wondered if that's a rule of yours and if you could take us through it. It is, it's, I, I believe two things in comedy, especially, I feel like um, so many great stories come out of comedic angles, come out of people being comfortable enough to reveal the details that led them to a life in comedy, which are usually funny personal stories and, you know, uh, perspectives and thing that happened. And that, you know, I've been on shows before where you show up and it is tense and yeah, the work gets done, especially the old multicam days, you know, cause I'm a thousand years old, I'm just very bangsy. So I look young, um, but I'm, I, people will not believe this. I think I am 40 years older than Brett. Is that true, Brett? Well, what's interesting is I just looked at uh, Jan, who's doing the sign language, and when you said, uh, so I look young, she went, <laughs> I wonder if that's I buy what that means. Buy but uh, anyways, back to the, the writer's room, I, I, I do um, uh, think you got to get to know each other and get so comfortable that you can reveal those details and they lead to the best stories and the best moments and the moments that people always single out as authentic, you know. Um, uh, look, in Ted Lasso, not to be a spoiler, but we, Brett, you and I both know that panic attack story comes directly from someone's life that would not be comfortable speaking about it otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, and how it brought them, them closer to someone else. Um, and I also think shows often are under this weird time crunch that they have to start outlining right away. And my mentor, Gary Goldberg, who did Family Ties and Brooklyn Bridge and we created Spin City together, um, his biggest pet peeve was with all those multi-camera sitcoms back in the day with the bad ones, you could be in a writing room and have a joke and someone would go, oh, this other character hasn't had a joke this scene. And you could just take that joke and give it to another character. And he used to say, if you can take a joke and any character can say it, you don't really have characters, you just have talking heads. Mm -hmm. And so what I always like to do as far as how we start a writer's room and we, we did it for you know, a couple of weeks that you combine getting to know each other with what might seem boring, but talking about each character's dynamic with each other character. You know, yeah. uh, we did that for a few weeks and people think they're just talking, but they are developing stories. And if you went back and looked at those notes, you know, every major conflict or um, overlap you know, that we had between um, different regulars um, became a key part of an episode, if not a whole episode on its own. And it's only funny. doing that can you like kind of then map out their journeys, you know? Yeah, because I, I was, I'd forgotten that it was like, um, like we all had uh, pitching blue balls because for the first four weeks, every time someone would go, oh, what about 
for a story and you'd go, no, we're not talking story yet. And it'd be like, ah, and we'd just be talking character, character, character. So that by the time the four weeks were up and we could talk, you, you were like, come in with some story pitches. Everyone was like, Bleh! because we've been building this sort of, uh, like that, it was clever. It, it became very, it, you know, it, it changes the story part and makes that very easy. And you often will, if you do this, I feel, that you'll, you won't find yourself in the position of throwing stories away, which was such a, a big part of uh, my early comedy writing, you know, doing um, multi-camera run-throughs for a studio or a network and someone going, the B story doesn't work and it's Wednesday, so throw it away and write a new story by Friday morning. And you'd be like, what? Um, can't we just add some more jokes and then come back to fight another day next week? <laughs> and, uh, um, um, but, Sometimes that was folly, but sometimes it was correct. And the stories just weren't working because they didn't line up with certain characters or, or, mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, certain attitudes and personalities. What was cool, if you do this, you think you're wasting time, but then the, these are the stories we're telling happens like this. You know what I mean? It, it goes yeah. really quickly. And do you, uh, do you have a, a particular role on them? Um sort of pitching small stories first and then big stories and narrative arcs for this season or has that worked? Uh, you know, it's been tough for me, man. I'm just graduating into the streaming world. You know, I've done cable shows before um, and, uh, but network shows, you know, there's probably some young writers and people that wanna be writers listening to us. And um, Comedy writing for me started Spin City as an example. We did a hundred episodes in four seasons. So we did 26, then 24, then 25, and then 25. And you don't have the time to say, these are gonna be the arcs. These are gonna be what we try to accomplish. And you literally are like, oh my God, I hope I'm alive by Christmas, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. um, back then our strategy used to be, what's an arc that can take us through the first half of the season, where do we want to end the year for these characters? And then we'll just find stuff in the middle that's funny. And what I really like that you guys, all you younger writers brought me into was um, talking a little bit about stories we wanted to do, but then in a big picture, talking about the journeys, you know, over overarching journeys that we wanted each character to take during a season. And I found that fascinating because you um, uh, lost the necessity to kind of begin to have a middle and end of a story in every episode. You could yeah. you know, kind of sprinkle stuff in as we went. So it's changed my perspective a little bit. I used to kind of map out, um, uh, you know, just episodes as fast as possible. And if you remember what we did now is we divided our first 10 episode season up into two blocks of five. And before we talked about specific stories said, Here's where the characters are starting and here's where we need them to be by the fifth episode and then kind of laid stories into that stuff. It's interesting because doing the, this as a, as a streaming show, I also think it changed, slightly changes the rules of sitcom as well in terms of, in Ted Lasso certainly, characters are allowed to change and grow and usually the rule in sitcom is no one changes. It sort of ends as it began, everything goes back to how it was. But in Ted Lasso, people do change and they do grow and you just sort of have to find new ways of that being funny. It's kind of different. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's such an interesting construct the way, I, I think people get frustrated right now if their characters don't evolve. You know, I faced it for the first time on Scrubs and it, you know, I give props to, to Zach Braff is, you know, um, in like the sixth year of that show, he said, I think I'm getting a little long in the tooth to be as goofy and ridiculously immature and silly. And even if it's slow, I need to start growing up a little or people are gonna wanna murder me, you know? And uh, um, on the other hand, I'm still a person, you know, I could watch Cheers beginning to end this weekend. And I love the consistency of who the characters are. And I love, you know, that there's something very, kind of comforting in knowing that when Sam Malone has a button in his shirt undone and the girl he's dating says, you know, sometimes I feel like we aren't on the same plane um, intellectually. I mean, you're, you accidentally have your shirt unbuttoned and he said, oh, it's not an accident. I leave that button undone so I can scratch my stomach. 
And uh, <laughs> I love that moment. He could have made that joke in episode one and he made it in like episode 130. Um, yeah. I don't know what the answer to that is. You know, I know um, that I'm finding it a lot more exciting as a writer to have these people evolve, but it's also not daunting because you and I both know that this one's going to end uh, after three yeah. years. Yeah, that's true. Am I giving um, you that right now? You what? Am I giving you that news right now? That this yeah. Is <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, well, let me really ask you, you did, it, did you do an anthology series? By the way, just so everybody knows, yeah. uh, uh, one of the stereotypes of writers and producers, um, um, and it's kind of true in the US, is that we're all procrastinators. And if you have a job, there's nothing better than, um, especially if you have the comfort of not having to hunt for work of being lazy. Um, and Brett was uh, a producer writer on our show, acting in our show, uh, which uh, uh, he you know, filmed his own audition as one of the writers and Jason loved it. Uh, he had written uh, a big feature that uh, for, uh, what was that? It was Nan, right? A big British yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Had written a big feature that was uh, coming out and shooting simultaneously while running his co-running his first tv show of his own that i think you had to fly to spain a lot like thursday to sunday every week yeah um, and i just watched you and thought it was you know i couldn't have think of anything more exhausting and at working that hard um but the well, it made me think did yeah. you write an anthology so that each episode could have its own mini movie and that you didn't have to in your brain while you're multitasking trace this thing over like, you know, season, season, season. Well, season. I, I, I was saying to uh, Will Bridges, the co-creator, co-showrunner of Soulmates, the anthology show, that the creatively writing an anthology show is really exciting because every every episode is brand new, brand new world. It's like, it is like making a movie, like we made six movies, but it's so much harder because every week you're writing a brand new movie and you just, if you get it right, each each episode, if you've done it well, people will say, oh, I could have seen more of these characters, but that means you've created an, it's like doing pilots, you've made this whole new world and then you get rid of it. All that work and all that world building, you get rid of it, you have to start again. And from a production point of view, it's a fucking nightmare because you have to check <laughs> Brand new locations, brand new cars, brand new everything. It's like a nightmare. I would not recommend an anthology. And what I also realized is writing the season two of Ted Lasso, which we've just finished, I called up Will to say one thing that I have never experienced before until now is writing, writing the script that I write for season two of Ted Lasso was a joy because I know the characters so well. I know the actors. I know how everyone sounds like. I'm not saying it was easy, but it was kind of easy because it was a, yeah. a, a well, new world. Right you, know, you know how a character would speak and you yeah. know what, how they behave in a certain situation. Because this is a conversation about writing and writing, I was fascinated by the fact that, you know, all I'm doing at this stage of my career is I hitch my wagons to very talented uh, uh, young men and women um, and, um, and then do fun panels like this when I take credit for their hard work um, is, as I've been torturing Brett and trying to get him to do another show with me and my company, he was very candid to say that though he's very good at it, he did not love show running. And what did you not love about it? Right. If there's any potential, if there's any budding showrunners out there, here's what I don't think people tell you. Yes, it's great. What people don't tell you is so much of it is really boring. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> but no one, I've never seen a thing about show running where someone says it's also really boring. <laughs> yeah, you're like, a, like when I go, hey, hanging out with a bunch of writers and you get final cut and choose the music and do the casting, so yeah. fun. And then that's like 65% and then 35% is 35% your is nightmarish. Like, it's, tw it's a 24 hour job for a year for a show, I'd say is what it, what it was. And because you're in charge of everything, you're in charge of everything. There's things you you think, I don't give a shit, but you still have to go. You still have to go and talk to someone about, I don't know, the labels that are gonna be on a wall somewhere that no one's ever gonna see. And the, the, the 
just the relentlessness of you're in charge of everything, all the edits you've got to be, you've got to be, all the shoots you've got to be. You're, and, and there's something kind of odd about it that you're not the director, but you are, you're there on set, you're giving notes on everything. So oh, and the, the directors have to answer to you in television in ways they don't in any other medium. It's very odd. So odd. There's so many, it, there's just a lot. And do not for a second underestimate how grateful and lucky I am to, to ever be in this position. And in all seriousness, it's an amazing thing. But it is intense in a way. Uh, that I think is hard to put across in that, in that you feel like you're working as hard. I, I did have this revelation one night where I was like, I don't think I've slept for like nine months and I'm working as hard as if I'm like an ER surgeon and I'm not doing anything worthwhile. <laughs> like, I will not, tell you, we used to do, and I, I still, certain people have trouble with it. I think if you're going to be, a, if you're a huge control freak, like huge and you have to do everything and that's how you sustain your life, you can do it. Or if you're okay empowering other people completely, you know, and realizing, you know, uh, I'm gonna trust other creative forces, you're okay to do it. Anything in the middle, I think gets a little crazy making. I'll tell you, is it an epiphany for me and you made me think about it, is one of the first shows I created, we used to do the joke because the person in charge of the props um, was uh, uh, lovely. Uh, uh, but he would always come to me for approval. And because I had 9 million emails, he always thought it was easier just to walk into the writer's room. And like, if we had someone with a phone, he would walk in and hold up a phone to me. And I'd go, yeah, man, that's fine. It's a phone. And he'd leave. And that was our approval process for props until okay. I finally realized, and this is something I would insist when you're running a show for me and, and then bringing the money directly over to my house, the, uh, <laughs> I would insist that you learn that the next step, and I did it, was I took him aside and said, hey man, um, how about this? How about you choose the props? And I only speak to you if I ever think one is wrong, and that'll be a record. Go inside in. Uh, uh, Life-saving technique in this stuff is empowering other people. And mm. uh, uh, it's an advantage also that comes with if you're lucky enough to do this for a long time, um, surrounding yourself with people that you've worked with before so they know your shorthand and you know theirs. It, I'm telling you, yeah. I sound like I'm trying to sucker Brett into running a show. I am. Uh, that's what this panel's about for me. But some of that bureaucratic nightmare goes away. That's interesting. Well, uh, yeah, and look, I'm definitely guilty of being an absolute control freak because there is that thing where I sort of go, oh, it's fine, do it without me. And then I'll see it and go, no, no, I should have been there. You know, no, it's completely like, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute madness. Um, I, I had to, by the way, it was, it was tough for me on Ted Lasso to bring it back. And I'm lucky that I was forced to do this. Be it would have been very hard for me um, to give up as much creative control um, to Jason Sudeikis um, if he was just a random person I had been partnered with. Uh, and the fact that he the, created this character and that that predated me, freed me up, do you know what I mean? In a way that your ego and narcissism had to go away and I had to go like, oh, you know, you know, usually when I create a show, I'm like, these characters are mine. And then eventually I'll give yeah. a little of them to the actors and actresses for them to own, uh, immediately, that character's his, you know? And I mean, you're in the room, he embodies them, you know? Yeah, he's amazing. i tell you one thing for the writers watching if you've not experienced it. The other thing that was really great and the first time I'd experienced it with this show, and you had talked about this, but then I saw it happen, was that once we had this amazing cast, not including myself, but everyone else, amazing cast, that went, I'd say by episode three, when we had fallen in love with all the actors and it changed the scripts, it changed, it meant you were writing to the actor rather than to the character in a way, the characters all became half the actor, half the character. And I think particularly with Keely, the character of Keely really changed as we got to you know Juno and what she was really like. And I thought that was just fascinating that. I, I think it's a real important point is we talk about writer's rooms and um, what I'm always amazed at are the shows. I mean, mm -hmm. I know a lot of dramas have to do this because of production that, um, Features sometimes work because you hear these stories of directors getting in there with the actors and actresses and they all talk about this communal experience. And there's so many TV shows 
the, the writing, writer's room and the cast are completely autonomous um, and rarely overlap and rarely get to know each other. And for me, um, it's only worked for me so far when I found these claustrophobic situations that by week three, you know, that the actors and actresses and writers and camera people and artisans and props and set, set deck and all that know each other and are connected in a way that it makes it all easier. You know, that you're not sending something out into a vacuum and going, hope this person can pull this off, hope these people can shoot it, hope it, but instead you're going, uh, this is in this person's wheelhouse because I know him or her and this director totally understands what we're doing and he or she's going to nail it. I just find that kind of communal aspect of TV making to be what I love so much about comedy specifically, you know, and uh, why I think sometimes people do in hours, I can't believe you know, they're able to do it when they say, oh no, the writing staff's here, but the show shoots in Atlanta. It's so weird. Yeah, it's so weird. I'll say this, I'm going to play you a compliment, but it's also advice, uh, which is, so I first met Bill Lawrence uh, by acting, I, I was in a pilot uh, that uh, was shot, but didn't get picked up sadly, but it was a good pilot. But, but day one of that pilot, and he did the same on Ted Lasso, he sort of called everyone together on set, actors and crew, everyone. And he said, you know, thank you all for being here. We're all excited. Everyone's, we're, you know, it was very nice that, uh, and welcoming everyone. But he said, I have a no dickhead rule, I believe. No asshole, no no asshole. asshole rule. And he said, I don't want the actors to go back to your trailers between takes. He said, I want everyone to hang out. He said, I want everyone to hang out. You should all hang out with each other. You should all be friends. Because I truly believe the more your friends in real life, the more that chemistry will play on screen. And we'll also have a much nicer time. And it's, uh, I just, that's how I always want to work. It's how I always choose to work. And anytime I've had bad experiences in work, I'm always like, why would you make this hard? Like, it can be so nice, but I love that that is, has always been your role. And I think it's well, very important. And please know I, that I'm not a crazy person. I don't mean that beyond a pilot that writers can't go take, uh, you know, go eat lunch and actors and actresses can't go nap and camera people yeah. can't all ass home with it. I just mean, you know, developing, it's a cliche. You know, oh, we're like a family, but developing relationships yeah. where you reciprocally take care of each other in the pilot experience. You know, if you're lucky enough to get to do a show, doing a TV show is like being at Thanksgiving with your family only for six months at a time. And, uh, yeah. We all know what that means is like that uncle that should not have that like fifth glass of wine, you know, and just I'll tell you something, Bill, I am still friends with all of those actors from that pilot and I worked with them for 10 days. Like it, it was real. And I was I, a, I was was a, you, uh, by the way, I, you know, I don't like it when you bring up shows that I was involved in writing that uh, uh, were uh, not become successful. It makes me feel bad about myself. But, and I'm in a shame spiral. I like to okay. keep that I don't okay, have. let's go back, let's go back to Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso's done very well. Uh, but, but I do think, it's like I was saying, you know, it is an all, if you're making something, if you're lucky enough to make something and get to that stage, it is all consuming, it is all the time, it is it's your life for those six months or the year or whatever it is. So you better have a nice time with everyone because this is your life. Like, this is actually your life, that time you're spending. And I do not, I don't think that having tension and anger and stress leads to better art. And particularly in comedy, I think everyone actually has to be comfortable to be free to try stuff and embarrass themselves and take risks and fail. You can't do that if you're scared or you're uncomfortable. I think that's also, important. Also, look, add to that um, something, all right, something, uh, I'm so grateful to have work during a horrible time out there and to be yeah. able to spend time with everybody in a writer's room and, and people that I would want to, young men and women that I would want to spend time with anyways, because they're funny and interesting and diverse and just, you know, all from different walks of life is super fun. Um, I think one of the other reasons selfishly to create a good environment is I, you know, look, we're talking to a bunch of people, I'm sure that are writers and a bunch of people that are hoping to eventually get paid as writers. My dad taught me a lesson when I was younger. My dad, um, uh, he thinks he's the last guy on earth to have worked his entire career at age 21 until he retired for the same company, Pitney Bowes. And um, I was, when I was 24, I was bitching and moaning um, 
about work. And my dad said, I just got to tell you um, that to hear you whining in any way, shape or form about getting paid to sit around a table with funny people and make jokes uh, and occasionally walk somewhere and get coffee and candy bars that other people buy for you. It's like, if I hear it again, I'm going to um, reach through the phone and smack you, <laughs> which I love as a visual image is just his hand coming out and, doing, you know, and giving me one of those. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I think if you embrace how fun the gig is, even in the ups and downs, and, and there are downs, very hand to mouth, you could be, you know, uh, uh, searching for a job, always worried about your next job, which is kind of a tough way to go through life when you're building a family or doing whatever. But if you create that good environment, it's, it makes it a lot harder to um, um, not be grateful, you know, to, to, yeah. to get to do this for a living. I'm, I'm grateful that I still get to do it. I mean, I, I, I say to many people, including you, that um, the men and women that I, I said this, Chris Miller and Phil Lord, I created a show called Clone High with them. Um, and they are so talented. They did Into the Spider-Verse and, um, uh, you know, both of the Jump Street movies and the Lego movies, and they're so good. And I joke with them, but it's one of those truth and jest things. I'm like, you guys, along with you, Brett, uh, are on my list of people that just uh, have to give me a job when I'm no longer hireable. <laughs> because, you know, this is, that's all I'm doing is lining up people so that when my career's over, I can eke four more years of workout because it's so fun and it's so fulfilling. So consider yourself part of that, my friend. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> shall we Shall we dare to look in the queue? Oh, I wanted to ask you one more question before I go. Yeah, one more question, we'll do some Q&A. What's up? Yeah, my question to you is, what's, to you, what's the best and worst thing about being a showrunner? And go worst first so we end on a positive. What's, what's your worst thing about being a showrunner? Uh, my, the worst thing uh, uh, about being a showrunner is, and I'll, um, I'll give you an example of this first, is um, uh, everybody made fun, of, Scrubs went for a long time, and we all made a joke that by the end of um, Scrubs, um, uh, every single writer and most cast members had been in my office crying at some time or another, just because it's life. And, uh, and uh, um, I am the last person on earth that is emotionally or psychologically equipped for that. And the other writers used to eventually do a sketch because I didn't even realize I was doing it. But when someone would come into my office and need to talk about something real, um, I would subconsciously grab the stapler and the tissue. I would be building a wall between the two of us. So <laughs> Eventually, I was like, so you have to leave the show because, you know, because uh, <laughs> and so uh, I'm joking, but uh, I would say the double edged sword of becoming so close to people when ultimately you are the one that has to say no to a lot of things that other people you like and care about um, are really interested in um, getting a yes to uh, and I, I don't love that part, you know what I mean? Um, uh, I don't love the times in my career that I've had to um, let people go. Um, uh, it always revolves around personal stuff. I, I can remember an, you know, an actor that fell in love with an actress on the show and, and I said, hey, you know, I'm not your dad, we're almost the same age, but you gotta know if this goes south and you don't handle it perfectly, you know, there's ramifications for you. And uh, that person did not handle it perfectly. And that person did not go forward on a show that lasted for another group of years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think the double-edged sword of telling everybody they can contribute and everybody they can throw in an idea and everybody that should have the pride of ownership, like even on Spin City, Scrubs, Cougar Town, we'd tell, you know, if, a, if the person holding the boom mic has a joke idea, I would always say, hey, throw it out there as long as your feelings aren't hurt. If, you know, we say, ah, no, that's not fun. Um, um, it's tough. I understand the people and they make it work that want to create a more corporate environment so that they're protected from that, you know, from having to let people down that you care about. Um, that's the worst part, but I still wouldn't trade it for anything. Best part, the rest of it. 
best part? Nah, you know what, man? The uh, uh, I realized that there's so many best parts, first of all, um, okay. that you get to be the bossy boss and make all the decisions. And, uh, you know, one of the things I used to do on Scrubs, I don't know I thought about this, is we'd sometimes have second favorite jokes for joke spots. And then I'd walk up to sex. We were in a deserted hospital. Um, and I'd say, um, uh, if a joke didn't work, I would pretend to come up with the, uh, um, um, the joke that we had already had written, like just in the moment. Um, and, uh, 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 oh, drove the other writers insane. Cause then people <laughs> are like, Oh my God, he's so quick. Um, and, uh, it was always as a joke. I'd always admit it. I swear. Uh, but, uh, that's just an example of how there's so many good moments, but what's more important about that is the sense of shared experience and community. And we were talking about it today because even though I'm so grateful that we're getting to write the second season of Ted Lasso and third season, um, we've done it without ever seeing each other in person. And I miss that. And I think it's why writers, um, some writers gravitate towards television comedy specifically is it is the writer's life without being as isolated and lonely. And you have this community of like-minded people around who you care about. And that's, that's the best part. And I'm saying it because I've been missing it this year a bunch. Yeah, I love that. Right, now we've been sent some questions, Bill. I'm gonna yeah, ask you. Cool. I want you to answer some too. I might ask you some if I see some. Let's uh, pick there's, some there's one, if you open the chat, we've been sent some selections. There's one from David Meyer, yeah. uh, he says, it's a good question. He says, how do you make sure you balance drama properly with comedy? Ted Lasso and Scrubs are masterful at towing the line. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, David. Um, it's a good question. If um, there was an easy answer, uh, there would be no stinkers. It's like when someone's like, how do you uh, make it so your show's always successful and works? I've got a bunch of absolute shit bombs in my past. So I'm just super lucky that most of them were so bad they didn't get on television. Um, my point is that um, uh, one of the things we knew about Scrubs was that our worst episode, we try to walk this tightrope, right? Um, and we didn't start this. Shows like MASH started it, you know, that balance between broad, silly comedy and stories of emotional depth. But we always knew it's like, hey, if you, um, um, are too silly and then try to switch gears to a really emotional thing, it's going to be disastrous. Or if you're too dark and emotional and then you try to switch gears and be really silly, um, it's going to be equally awful. And your worst episodes are going to be when you don't calibrate that. And so I don't think that there's um, a rule. I think music and editing and reshoots can sometimes save you. But it is the, um, for me personally, that's the tightrope I like to, to, to um, walk. I like to do comedies that the people care about the characters and that there's inherently some emotional stakes. I, my, my experience of that is, is it often comes, you know, the phrase kill, kill, kill your babies. I think there's often you don't, you don't, you can't quite work out what's not working. And the answer is, it's because you're in love with this joke. You're, you're, you're in love with this joke, you don't want to see it go, but if you let that joke go, this moment's now going to be moving as it should be. And vice versa, you know, there's always, I always think about this. Uh, if you have a look on the um, deleted scenes of Austin Powers 3 Gold Member, there's, <laughs> uh, there's a musical montage where the entire class sings What's It All About Austin? And it's genuinely absolutely beautiful it's really moving and it's like it's a proper beautiful piece of cinema and when i saw that i was like how would you cut that that's amazing but apparently in all the test screenings it was so moving that no one laughed ever again for the rest of the film so they had to cut it and i think that's a really good example of i used to make i used to make this mistake a lot because the network when i first pitched scrubs was always like you can't do this silly broad fantasy scene and then do the scene of these people dying. And I'd always be like, I don't know. I feel like if I turn the lights down and put some kind of emotional indie song on, it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it didn't, man. Next uh, question. All right, let's see. Uh, well, there's one. Uh, there's one, well, there's one for me here. I'll talk about it quickly. Do it, I'll ask you something about what's it. What's the one for you? It says, it says, Brett, can you talk about developing Roy's character as a writer-producer as well as an actor? 
I can. So uh, it's a weird question for an evening with Bill Lawrence, but I'm down. Um, <laughs> I'll do it quickly. You know, it is interesting to me because uh, I want to see what your answer is, and then I'll tell you why it was fascinating to watch this evolve. It was, it was something I've never experienced before in a TV show. What was it, what's your answer to that? Well, my answer is, is my, my recollection of it, that we had never discussed me being Roy. There was no conversation about me being Roy. And while we were in the writer's room, I was secretly, quietly thinking, I really understand Roy and think I really get it. But I also knew that no one would think of me for it because I am uh, certainly usually playing very soft, sweet. Sort you're of softy, sweet. you're sweet, you're lovely, you're sensitive, and it is against type for who you are as a human, yes. And what no one knows is that I'm secretly a boiling, boiling cauldron of rice. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I thought, I think I can play this, but I didn't want to embarrass anyone, I didn't want to make it awkward, and I didn't want to be a dickhead. So I went, on the last day in the room, I made a tape for my, with no, didn't tell anyone, I made this tape, and then I emailed it, and I said, look, if this is shit, please pretend you never got this email. But I do think I could play Roy, and that's and that's how that happened. And then I got the part. And then who, uh, who, cha who championed you after you sent that email? I believe it was you, Bill Lawrence. Oh, that's right, that's right, that was me. Um, hey, we're back. We're back. <laughs> uh, no, this but, is what was. This is what was. Uh, uh, by the way, and Jason well, embraced well, Joe and Brendan. But the, the, this is what I thought was so fascinating about it was watching the character was not written for Brett. Um. And uh, I think people, um, and I really believe this about show running, that's why it's a good question. And I think people saw, like, think of like Vinnie Jones, you know, um, uh, that level tough guy. Um, uh, and uh, uh, people saw him as being that in their heads. And when Brett gave a, um, an audition, it was great because he could pull off the angry tough stuff. But because of who Brett is, there was an undercurrent of sensitivity um, uh, that changed a character that was already written. And this is what I think was great. And it was great that Jason was down for this and all the other writers on the show too, was I, uh, I often see, especially young showrunners, they um, do two mistakes. They either cast someone who is not exactly what they uh, wrote and then keep trying to get that person to play exactly what they wrote, even if it is not completely in their wheelhouse, yeah. or they will pass over somebody that is in the audition process that is more talented because they don't exactly match who that character is. And I believe that you get the most talented person and then you look at the character since it's gonna ultimately be theirs anyways, and you tweak it to suit them, and those will be richer and better. Uh, um, and those are the ones that have always worked for me. Like uh, my best example, Sarah Chalk um, is not at all like Elliot on Scrubs was supposed to be. She was supposed to be a um, uptight, um, uh, which Sarah could do, but very kind of sardonic, cynical, hard-edged um, young woman from Greenwich, Connecticut. And I always made a mistake in that show. There's still a scene in that show that drives me crazy is the network. I remember didn't think she was able to pull that off at all. So one of the early scenes we shot, Sarah Chalks in rounds wearing very, you know, strident looking glasses, yeah. you know, to make her look edgier and, uh, you know, kind of more withdrawn. And it was so stupid. It's the only time she ever wore glasses on that show. It was so dumb. It's like, that's how we'll fix it. And I finally was like, no, nah, you know what? Sarah Chalk talks 9,000 miles an hour. She constantly blows her bangs out of her face. Um, she goes high pitched when she's upset. Let me ditch, you know, I don't have to change the story, but let's ditch the things I've stuck in my head and lean into her. And she, I thought she was amazing. And it was, you know, so um, um, that's what I think is a, kind of the lesson for showrunners out there. Lean into who you're working with, go with the most talented person. Yeah, and, and and as it went on, but I think it happened with all the actors. I just was lucky enough to experience it as well. Is like, I, I became very, uh, like I'm almost embarrassed about this because because to hit if someone else said this, I'd think you you dickhead. But like, I I became very protective of Roy. Like sometimes I'd read certain lines and I'd think Roy wouldn't say that. Oh, Roy. you said Roy wouldn't say. By the way, the the downside, even though you love it, of having. Uh, whether it be Brendan Hunt, who's Coach Beard, or Phoebe Walsh, who plays Jane, the girlfriend, or 
or uh, uh, Brett who plays Roy or Jason in there is like, oh, does this line work? The uh, negative is you will occasionally get the, uh, uh, Roy wouldn't say that. And you have to live with that because for me, uh, I want the actors and actresses to, I want there to be a shift of ownership. When you write a pilot, the characters are yours. Uh, and this is my philosophy, it's not everybody's. It's not Aaron Sorkin's, he's next. I think he thinks that you know, in his head, the characters are his till the end of time and that works. Um, I think that you know, they're yours when you write the pilot and then it becomes a 50-50 split. And then for me, it, it shifts the other way. So the other, just Brett's very greedy and he decided he owned all of the character almost immediately. <laughs> Oh, I, I said that for all the characters. I a bit wouldn't say that. <laughs> and everyone um, goes, oh, someone say something. No, 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 no. Jane wouldn't say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a question because this, this part seems fun. All right, we got one. Um, uh, uh, Ted Lasso is a character very positive. How did you get away with making the show an edgy, uh, dark world? Um, and, then, uh, and then there's a, uh, a co-show running question that's good. Um, look. One of the things that you will run into, even in this world of streaming, is people following trends. Um, I used to do that as a writer. You know, my wife jokes that she is on, was on for years, one of the only successful shows that, at least in part, you know, was given an opportunity because someone's like, oh, let's do Friends in the Midwest, the Drew Carey show, you know. Um, and, uh, uh, um, where Ted Lasso started, I, I'm a comedy writer, Brett's a comedy writer. We love snarky, edgy. I could watch Veep till the end of time. They're reprehensible characters. They invent new ways to curse and they're horrific to each other. We just um, were in a cynical time where all social discourse was so dark and edgy. And I remember all of us talking about the fact that for me anyways, if I met Ted Lasso in real life, I would assume that it would be like, let's, I'll wait two weeks and then we'll see the mask come off and this guy will be such an asshole. And the truth is two weeks later, if he was that sincere and pure of spirit, um, um, then two weeks later, you'd have to look at yourself and go, whoa, what have I become that I don't trust sincerity, you know, uh, that I don't trust kindness and optimism and hope, you know, which is what Jason really wanted to, uh, to put out there. I say this as a warning. We put it out there because it made us feel good and it's something we wanted to do, not because we were chasing something. And I will tell you now, even comedically in my own career as someone that has you know, been creating shows for 25 years, I'm now getting calls from people going, hey, you know that pilot of yours um, that we're working on or that we didn't like that's this way? What if you do that thing, like that Ted Lasso thing and make that character that has nothing to do with Ted Lasso super optimistic and hopeful and maybe you know, maybe a little bit slow on the uptake. Of, I'm like, I get it. I get it. You want me to do Ted Lasso again? That's not. Um, so my point is um, do what's in your heart and head because you think it works creatively, not because you think it's what will work. Here is a question that I don't think has been asked uh, that I think is useful to people. And I'm not even sure I know the answer is if you are meeting a writer, you, Bill Lawrence, are having a, like an interview with a writer, what do, you, what do you want from that? What's the best thing that a writer can do if they wanted to get a job with you? Um, I judge on the written material. I judge on anecdotal. Um, you know, so, so I start by judging. Uh, when I meet with someone, I'm generally just meeting with them to make sure that um, we don't rub each other the wrong way and that we can tolerate each other. Um, that's number one. Uh, uh, number two, just know on every job that, you know, somebody once grabbed me when I was young and said, hey, this is a weird thing, but I want you to understand this. There's 20 people in Hollywood. And once you've worked with one of those 20, they're going to tell the other 19 what you're like, right? And so my point is that has value because it tells you, you might end up on a job that sucks or on a job you get fired from quick or a pilot that doesn't work or a punch up gig that's lame. Just remember how you present yourself as a human being, because for a lot of people like me, the starting point is to go, oh, Joe Schmo, um, uh, Cindy Schmo. I don't know what the female equivalent of Joe Schmo is. Um, they worked once on this horrible disaster show with a person that I know who I really like and think is of high character. I'm gonna call that person and find out if this person was a jerk. So that's number one. Um, just realize Hollywood's got 20 people. Number two, is the it's about the written material 
because it's very, you know, if you get the opportunity to be a showrunner, sometimes we judge too much on how well the person dances with sparklers in your meeting. I try not to do that because draft right sometimes there's great, very quiet draft writers. Sometimes there's awesome vocal joke people. They're, they're all of value. But my one pet peeve that I want to put out there, especially for young people that might be watching, um, the cool for school thing that comes with youth, um, uh, ditch it. You know, um, uh, I, I have actually had multiple interviews with young writers who have said to me um, when I say, oh, what's your favorite TV show? What TV shows did you grow up on? There's actual people out there that because of the um, kind of pretentiousness that comes with wanting to be a writer have said, oh, I'm not like a huge fan of TV. And to all of them, I say, please go do something else because <laughs> just go do something you are a fan of even, you know, no matter what it is. So uh, the other thing that I look for is an absolute love of the medium, you know, and I would mm -hmm. say be prepared to talk about the shows that move you and the things that you wish that you had written. I think that's lovely. I also think to give hope to people who want to be on a writer's room, but are terrible writers. I also think that you, that there's still use if you've got 12 people in a writer's room, one person, can just be good vibes. <laughs> I think it's it's good to have someone in the room who's just good vibes, even if they're a terrible writer, but they bring a real positivity and love, uh, and you, you're just excited to see them. They they're good in the room. I have a personal philosophy, and um, it's the this is the one that'll get me in trouble, but I'm saying it anyways. The uh, um, there's a lot of showrunners out there that you'll see like, oh, they ditched their whole staff. They replaced everybody but one person. And I always find that so inane, uh, mm -hmm. personal, um, no judgment, except with lots of judgment. And I used to say, if you had a great 10 person writing staff, when you all create your own shows and you have your own vision, a great staff um, for me would be, all right, there's 10 people. There's three rock stars. Uh, Congratulations, there's three people that are so talented and so good that they could do the show without you and will ultimately do their own shows. Uh, and then there's four really good workers that can take the world, the outline, the characters you give them execute for, uh, you know, that's seven. And then there's three people that are not that great and don't contribute that much, but they're lovely to be around. That is the perfect writing staff and what you can hope for. And uh, I say that because so many people fire people and I feel like if they fire people and change it up, guess what? Next year they have the same exact makeup. But if they had kept those people, I, I've actually gotten to witness it. The three people at, that you think like, oh, they aren't contributing, but they're nice to be around. I can't tell you how many great stories, especially if they're young, especially if they're just starting out that year two, two of those three people are like, holy shit, they're contributing now. They're starting to get it because they're here and it's a positive environment. And by year three or four, you're like, wow, now those people, have, you know, the top people that were rock stars have gone to create their own show. The people in the middle that are really good have become rock stars out of, you know, working. And the people that you're like, they're of no help at all have become great workers. And then you keep backfilling with young writers. You know what I mean? That to me is the philosophy. I love it. Uh our time is is now up. That's a lovely way to end. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for watching. I would like to thank Bill Lawrence for being so open and honest. And most of all, I'd like everyone to do a huge round of applause for Jan Goldsby, the ASL interpreter who has been magnificent. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And watch this. My last thing I'm going to spit out because I teased someone with a co-showrunner question. If you hire a co-showrunner, make sure that their goal is to help you do your show, not take your show over. That's it. Look at that. I answered. I never yeah. teased. Um, Brett, right. thank you so much. Hey, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I will come back and pretend to interview when it's you when it's your turn to do this. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for See having us. Bye bye.